Hello, hello, this is Kareen from the North Balford Library. Uh, today we are going to be starting our kids book club. So what's going to happen is every Monday I'm going to read um, about 25 to 30 pages of our book, which is Anne of Green Gables by M. L. M. Montgomery or Lucy Maud Montgomery. And then at the end, I'm going to post a discussion question. So this first one we are gonna do as a live. So if anybody has any questions while I'm reading or anything like that, please feel free to comment. Again, my name is Kareem and I'm here from the North Balford Library. I do have some background music for us today just to help it be a little bit more soothing. And it is called Acoustic Breeze and I got that from bensound.com which is a royalty-free music website that is for putting with videos and things like that. So, I am going to read the first two chapters of um, Anne of Green Gables today. And I have actually never read Anne of Green Gables before. I'm kind of reading in the sections as we go. Like, I'll read the section just before we read them, but other than that, I am experiencing this book for the first time with you guys, so I hope you guys enjoy. Um, about two years ago, I actually did get to go to PEI for the first time to visit some friends and go for their wedding. And we, my husband and I, ended up having a vacation there during, and PEI is absolutely beautiful, and it actually has a lot of tourism based on Anne of Green Gables. The main setting, Avonlea, is actually a fictional place, but the um, government of PEI did actually put up a Green Gables thing and a museum. I haven't been to it yet. I think next time I go to visit my Islander friends. But yeah, so we're just going to jump right, right in. Again, I am reading the first two chapters of Anne and Green Gables. And of Green Gables, sorry. And to make it a little bit more fun, I got my pi Anne pigtails, and then we need the Anne straw hat as well. All right, so let us begin. Anne of Green Gables by L.M. Montgomery. Also, the reason why I've chosen to read this book is because it is in the public domain. All right, so Anne of Green Gables, chapter one. Miss. Mrs. Rachel Lynn is surprised. Hi, Maggie! Mrs. Rachel Lynn lived just where the Avalon, Avonlea main road dipped down into a little hollow, fragged with adlers and lady eardrops, and traversed by a brook that had its source way back in the woods of the old Cuthbert's place. It was reputed to be an ancient Incorrect. Sorry, guys, my tongue just isn't wanting to work today. Headlong brook in its earlier course through the woods, with dark secrets of pool and cascades. But by the time it reached Lynn's Hollow, it was a quiet, well conducted, well conducted little stream. For not even a brook could run past Mrs. Rachel Lynn's door without due regard for decency and decorum. It was probably, it probably was conscious that Mrs. Rachel was sitting by her window, keeping a sharp eye on everything that passed, from brooks and children up. And if she noticed anything odd or out of place, she would never rest until she had ferreted out the whys and whereforths thereof. There were plenty of people in Avonlea and out of it who can attend closely to their neighbor's businesses, neighbor's business by dint of neglecting their own. But Mrs. Rachel Lynn was one of those capable creatures who can manage their own concerns and those of other folks in the bargain. She was a notable housewife. Her work was always done and well done. She ran the sewing circle, helped run the Sunday school, and was the strongest prop of the church aid society and foreign missions auxiliary. Yet, with all of this, Mrs. Rachel found abundant time to sit for hours at her kitchen window, knitting 
cotton warp quilts. She had knitted 16 of them, as Avonlea housekeepers were wont to tell in awed voices, and keeping a sharp eye on the main road that crossed the hollow and wound up near the steep red hill beyond. Since Avonlea occupied a tiny triangular peninsula jutting out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, with water on two sides of it, anyone who went out of it or into it had to pass over the hill road and so ran the unseen gauntlet of Mrs. Rachel's all-seeing eye. She was sitting there one afternoon in early June. The sun was coming in at the window warm and bright. The orchard on the slope below the house was in a bridal flush of pinky white bloom hummed over by a myriad of bees. Thomas Lynn, a meek little man who Avonlea people called Rachel Lynn's husband, was sowing his late seed, his late turnip seed on the hill field beyond the barn. And Matthew Kirk Bert ought to have been sowing on his, the big red brook field, away over by Green Gables. Mrs. Rachel knew that he ought because he, she heard him tell Peter Morrison the evening before in William J. Blair's store over at Card Melody that he meant to sow his turnip seed the next afternoon. Paul had asked him, of course, for Matthew Cuthbert had never been known to volunteer information about anything in his whole life. And yet, here was Matthew Cuthbert at half past three on the afternoon of a busy day placidly driving over the hollow and up over the hill. Moreover, he wore a white collar and his best suit of clothes, which was plain proof that he was going out of Avonlea. And he had the buggy and the sorrel mare, which betokened that he was going a considerable distance. Now, where was Matthew Cuthbert going, and why was he going there? Does anybody have any guests? Maggie, any idea? All right, um, if the words seem kind of weird and it's a weird style of writing, that's because this book was written um, in the early um, 1909 to 1910. It was published originally um, as a serial in magazines and then it was published as a book in 1911, okay? Had it been any other man in Avonlea, Mrs. Rachel, deftly putting this and that together, might have given a pretty good guess as to both questions. But Matthew so rarely went from home that it must be something pressing and unusual which was taking him. He was the shyest man alive and hated to have to go among strangers or to any place where he might have to talk. Matthew, dressed up with a white collar and driving in a buggy, was something that didn't happen often. Mrs. Rachel, ponder as she might, could make nothing of it, and her afternoon's enjoyment was spoiled. I'll just step over to Green Gables after tea and find out from Marla where he's gone and why, the worthy woman finally concluded. He doesn't generally go to town this time of year, and he never visits. And if he'd run out of turnip seed, he wouldn't dress up and take the buggy, buggy to go for more. He wasn't driving fast enough to go, be going for a doctor, yet something must have happened since last night to set him off. I'm clean puzzled, that's what, and I won't know a minute's peace of mind or conscience until I know what has taken Matthew Cutbirth out of Avonlea today. Okay. Accordingly, after tea, Mrs. Rachel set out. She had not far to go, the big family orchard in Bowerth House, where the Cuthberts lived, was a scant quarter of a mile up the road from Lynn's Hollow. To be sure, the long lane made it a good deal farther. Matthew Cuthbert's father, as shy and as silent as the son after him, had got as far away as he possibly could from his fellow men without actually retreating into the woods where he founded his uh, homestead. Hi, Marion! Green Gables was built at the furthest edge of, edge of his cleared land, and there it was to this day, barely visible from the main road along which all the Avonlea houses were so socially situated. 
Mrs. Rachel did not call it living in such a place living at all. It's just staying, that's what she said as she stepped along the deep rutted grassy lane bordered with wild rose bushes. It's no wonder Matthew and Marla are both a little bit odd, living away back here by themselves. Trees aren't much company, though dear knows if they were, there'd be enough of them. I'd rather look at people. To be sure, they seem content enough, but by then, I suppose, they're used to it. A body can get used to anything, even being hanged, as the Irishman said. With this, Mrs. Rachel stepped out of the lane into the backyard of Green Gables. Very green and neat and precise was that yard, set about on one side with great patriarchal willows and the other with pim lombardies. Not a stray stick nor stone was to be seen, for Miss Rachel would have had seen it if there had been. Privately, she was of the opinion that Mar Marla Cuthbert swept, swept that yard open as often as she swept her house. One could have eaten a meal off of the ground without overbrimming the per perbial peck of dirt. Mrs. Rachel rapped smartly at the kitchen door and stepped in when bidden to do so. The kitchen at Green Gables was a cheerful apartment, or would have been cheerful if it had not been so painfully clean as to give it the something of an appearance of an unused parlor. Its windows looked east and west, though the west one, looking out on the backyard, came a flood of meadow June sunlight. But the east one, where it's, you got a glimpse of the bloom white cherry trees in the left orchard and nodding, slender birches down in the hollow was grained over by a tangle of vines. Here sat Marla Cuthbert, when she sat at all, always slightly distrustful of sunshine, which seemed to her too dancing and irresponsible a thing for a world which was meant to be taken seriously. And here she sat now, knitting, and the table behind her was laid for supper. Miss Rachel, before she had fairly closed the door, had taken mental note of everything that was on the table. There were three plates laid, so that, so that Marla must be expecting someone home with Matthew to tea. But the dishes were everyday dishes, and there was only crab apple preserves and one kind of cake, so that the expected company could not be any particular company. Yet what of Matthew's white curler, collar? and the sorrel mare. Mrs. Rachel was getting fairly dizzy with this unusual mystery about quiet, unmysterious Green Gables. Good evening, Rachel, Marla said briskly. This is a real fine evening, isn't it? Won't you sit down? How are all of your folks? Something, for lack of any other name, might be called friendship existed and had always existed between Marla Cuthbert and Mrs. Rachel in spite of, or perhaps because of, their dissimilarity. Marla was a tall, thin woman with angles and without curves. Her dark hair showed some silver streaks and was always twisted up in a hard little knot behind with two wire hairpins stuck aggressively through it. She looked like a woman of narrow experience and rigid con conscience, which she was. But there had been a saving something about her mouth, which, if it had ever been so slightly developed, might have been considered indicative of a sense of humor. We're all pretty well, said Miss Rachel. I was kind of afraid you weren't, though, when I saw Matthew starting off today. I thought maybe he was going to the doctor's. Maria's lips twitched understandingly. She had expected Miss Rachel up. She had known that the sight of Matthew jaunting off so uncountably would be too much for her neighbor's curiosity. Oh no, I'm quite well, although I had a bad headache yesterday, she said. Matthew went up to Bright River. We're getting a little boy from an orthoman orphan asylum in Nova Scotia, and he's coming on the train tonight. If Marla had said that Matthew had gone to Bright River to meet a kangaroo from Australia, Mrs. Rachel could not have been more astounded.
She was actually stricken dumb for five seconds. It was unsupposable that Marlowe was making fun of her, but Miss Rachel was almost forced to suppose it. Are you in earnest, Marla? she demanded, when voice returned to her. Yes, of course, said Marla, as if game boys from orphan asylums in Nova Scotia were part of the usual spring work of any well-regulated Avonlea farm instead of being an unheard of innovation. <sighs> Sorry, guys, I have to keep having some water. <laughs> Miss Rachel felt as felt that she had received a severe mental jolt. She thought of she thought in exclamation points. A boy? Marla and Matthew Cuthbert, of all people, adopting a boy? From an orphan asylum? Well, the world was certainly turning upside down. She would be surprised, surprised at nothing after this. Nothing! What on earth put such a notion into your head? She demanded disapprovingly. This had been done without her advice being asked, and must appear for it be disapproved. Well, we've been thinking about it for some time. All winter, in fact, returned Marla. Mrs. Alexander Spencer was up here one day before Christmas, and she said she was going to get a little girl from the asylum over in Hopeton in the spring. Her cousin lives there, and Mrs. Spencer has visited her and knows all about it. So Matthew and I have talked it over on and off ever since. We thought we'd get a boy. Matthew is getting up in years, you know. He's 60, and he isn't so spry as he once was. His heart troubles him a good deal, and you know how desperate hard it's got to be to get hired help. There's never anything to be had but those stupid half-grown little French boys, and as soon as you get one broke into your ways and taught something, he's off, he's up and off to the lobster canneries or to the States. At first, Matthew suggested getting a homeboy. But I said no, flat to that. They may be all rich. I'm not saying that they're not. But no London Street Arabs for me, I said. Give me a native born at least. There'll be a risk no matter what, who we get. But I feel easier in my mind and sleep sounder at night if we get a born Canadian. So in the end, we decided to ask Mrs. Spencer to pick one, pick us out one when she went over to get her little girl. She heard last week she was going, so she, we sent her word by Richard Spencer's boat at Cardinality to Ca Cardmody, sorry, to bring us a smart, likely boy of about 10 or 11. We decided that that would be the best age, old enough to be of some use in doing chores right off, and young enough to be trained up proper. We mean to give him a good home and schooling. We had a telegram from Mrs. Ale Alexander Spencer today. The mailman brought it from the station, saying they were coming on the 5.30 train tonight. So Matthew went on to Bright River to meet him. Mrs. Spencer will drop him off there. Of course, she'll go on to White Stand Station herself. Rachel always prided herself on speaking her mind. She proceeded to do it, to speak it now, having adjusted her mental attitude to this amazing piece of news. Well, Marla, I'll just tell you plain that I think you're doing a mighty foolish thing. A frisky thing, that's what. You don't know what you're getting. You're bringing a strange child into your house and home, and you don't know a single thing about him, nor what his disposition is like, nor what sort of poor parents are in that, nor how he's likely to turn out. Why, it was only last week I read in the paper how a man and his wife up west of the island, took a boy out of an orphan asylum, and he set fire to the house at night, set it on purpose, Marla, and nearly burnt them to a crisp in their beds. And I know of another case, where an adopted boy used to suck the eggs. They couldn't break them of it. If you had asked my advice in the matter, which you didn't do, Marla, I have said, for mercy's sake, not to think of such a thing. That's what. This job's comforting seemed to neither offend nor alarm Marla. She knitted steadily on. I don't deny there's something in what you say, Rachel. I've had some qualms myself, but Matthew was terrible set on it. I could see that, so I gave in. It's so seldom, Matthew, 
is sets his mind on anything that when he does, I always feel it's my duty to give in. And as for the risk, there's risk in pretty near everything a, ch a body does in this world. There's risk in people having children of their own if it comes to that. They don't always turn out well. And then Nova Scotia is right close to the island. It isn't if we're getting him from England or the States. He can't be much different from ourselves. Well, I hope it will turn out all right, said Miss Rachel, in a tone that plainly indicated her painful doubts. Only don't say I didn't warn you if he burns Green Gables down or pours strychnine in the well. I heard of a case over in New Brunswick where an orphan asylum child did that, and the whole family died in fearful agonies. Only it was a girl in that instance. Well, we're not getting a girl, said Marla as if poisoning walls were a purely feminine accomplishment and not to be dreaded in the case of a boy. I'd never dream of bringing up a girl to... I'd never dream of taking a girl to bring up here. I wonder at Mrs. Alexander Spence for doing it. But there, she wouldn't shrink from adopting a whole orphan asylum if she took it into her head. Mrs. Rachel would have liked to stay until Matthew came home with his imported orphan but reflecting it would be a good two hours at least before his arrival, she concluded to go up the road to Robert Bell's and tell them the news. It would certainly make a sensation second to none, and Miss Rachel dearly loved to make a sensation, though she took herself away, somewhat to Marla's relief, for the later felt her doubts and fears reviving under the influence of Mrs. Rachel's pessimism. Well, of all the things that ever were or will be, ejaculated Miss Rachel when she was safely out in the lane. It does seem as if I must be dreaming. Well, I'm sorry for that poor young one, and make no mistake. Martha and Matthew, Marla and Matthew don't know anything about children, and they'll expect him to be wiser and steadier than his own grandfather, if so be he's ever had a grandfather, which is doubtful. It seems uncanny to think of a child at Green Gable somehow. There's never been one there, for Mar Matthew and Marla were both grown up when the new house was built, if they ever were children, which is hard to believe when one looks at them. I wouldn't be in that orphan's shoes for anything. My, but I pity them. That's what? So said Miss Rachel to the wild rose bushes out of the fullness of her heart. But if she could have seen the child who was waiting patiently at the Bright River Station at that very moment. Her pity would have been all the more deeper and more profound. All right. So that's the end of chapter one. I'm going to read one more chapter because my hope is that we're going to, I'll be able to do this once a week. Either we'll do it as Facebook Lives or I'll pre-record the videos and upload them but I want to basically have them every Monday except for um, holidays between now and the end of June. Okay guys, so we're going to read one more chapter. Chapter 2. Matthew Cuthbert is surprised. Matthew Cuthbert and the sorrel mare jogged comfortably over the eight miles to Bright River. It was a pretty road running along between snug farmsteads with now and again a bit of salmi fir wood to drive through, or a hollow where wild plums hung out their filmy bloom. The air was sweet with the breath of many apple orchards, and the meadows sloped away in the distance to horizon mists of pearl and white and purple. Wow. The little birds sang as if it were the one day of summer in all the year. Matthew enjoyed the drive after his own fashion, except during the moments when he met women, met women and had to nod to them. So nod. For in Prince Edward Island, you were supposed to nod to all and sundry you meet on the road, whether you know them or not. Matthew dreaded all women except Marla and Mrs. Rachel. He had an uncomfortable feeling that the mysterious creatures were secretly laughing at him. He may have been quite right in thinking so for he was an odd-looking person with an ungainly figure 
and long iron white, iron gray hair that touched his sloping shoulders, and a full, soft brown beard, which he had worn ever since he was twenty. In fact, he looked at twenty very much as he looked at sixty, lacking a little of the grayness. When he reached Bright River, there was no sign of any train. He thought it was too early, so he tied his horse in the yard of the small Bright River Hotel and went over to the station house. The long platform was almost deserted, the only living creature in sight being a girl who was sitting on a pile of shingles at the extreme end. Matthew, barely noting it was a girl, sidled past her as quickly as he could without looking at her. Had he looked, he could have hardly failed to notice the tense rigidity and expectation in her attitude and expression. She was sitting there waiting for something, or somebody, and since just sitting and waiting was the only thing to do just then, she sat and waited with all her might and main. Matthew encountered the station master locking up the ticket office preparatory to go home for dinner and asked him if the 5.30 train would be soon along. The 5.30 train has been in and gone half hour ago, answered that brisk official, but there was a passenger dropped off for you, a little girl. She's sitting there, out there on the shingles. I asked her to go into the ladies' waiting room, but she informed me gravely that she preferred to stay outside. There's more scope for the imagination, she said. She's a case, I should say. I'm not expecting a girl, said Matthew blankly. It's a boy I've come for. He should be here. Mrs. Alexander Spencer was to bring him over from Nova Scotia for me. The station master whistled. Yes, there's been some mistake, he said. Mrs. Spencer came off the train with that girl and gave her into my charge. Said you and your sister were adopting her from an orphan asylum and you'd be along for her presently. That's all I know about it and I haven't got any more orphans concealed hereabouts. I don't understand, said Matthew helplessly, wishing that Marla was at hand to cope with the situation. Well, you better question the girl, said the station master carelessly. I dare say she'll be able to explain. She's got a tongue of her own, that's for certain. Maybe they were out of boys of the brand you wanted. He walked jauntily away, being hungry, and the unfortunate Matthew was left to do, which was harder for him than bearding a lion in its den. Walk up to a girl, a strange girl, an orphan girl, and demand of her why she wasn't a boy. Matthew groaned in spirit as he turned about and shuffled gently down to the pa down the platform towards her. She had been watching him ever since he had passed her and she had her eyes on him now. Matthew was not really looking at her and when would not have seen what she was really like, if he had been, but an ordinary observer would have seen this. A child of about eleven, garbed in a very short, very tight, very ugly dress of yellowish gray white seat. She wore a faded brown sailor's cap, and beneath the hat, extending down her back, were two braids of very thick, decidedly red hair. Her face was small, white, and thin, also much, much freckled. Her mouth was large, and so were her eyes, that looked green in some lights and moods, and gray in others. So far, the ordinary observer, an extraordinary observer, might have seen that the chin was very pointed and pronounced, that the big eyes were full of spirit and vivacity, that the mouth was sweet-lipped and expressive, that the forehead was broad and full. In short, our discerning, extra, extraordinary observer might have concluded that no commonplace soul inhabited the body of this stray woman child of whom shy Matthew Cuthbert was so ludicrously afraid. Matthew, however, was spared the ordeal of speaking first, for as soon as she had concluded that he was coming to her, she stood up, grasping with one thin brown hand, hand the handle of a shabby old-fashioned carpet bag, 
The other she held out to him. I suppose you are Mr. Matthew Cuthbert of Green Gables, she said in a particularly clear, sweet voice. I'm very glad to see you. I was beginning to be afraid you weren't coming for me, and I was imagining all, so all the things that might have happened to prevent you. I had made up my mind that if you didn't come for me tonight, I'd go down the track to that big wild cherry, bee, cherry tree at the bend and climb into it to stay all night. I wouldn't be the bit afraid, and it would be lovely to sleep in a wild cherry tree all white with bloom in the moonshine, don't you think? You could imagine you were dwelling in marble halls, couldn't you? And I was quite sure you'd come for me in the morning, if you didn't tonight. Matthew had taken the scrawny little hand awkwardly and his, and then and there he decided what to do. He could not tell the ch this child with the glowing eyes that there had been a mistake. He would take her home and let Marla do that. She couldn't be left at Bright River anyhow, no matter what mistake had been made, so all questions and explanations might as well be deferred until he was safely back at Green Gables. I'm sorry I was late, he said shyly. Come along, the horse is over in the yard. Give me your bag. Oh, I can carry it, the child responded cheerfully. It isn't heavy. I've got all my worldly goods in it, but it isn't heavy. And if it isn't carried in just a certain way, the handle pulls out. So I'd better keep it, because I know the exact knack of it. It's an extremely old carpet bag. Oh, I'm very glad you've come, even if it would have been nice to sleep in a wild cherry tree. We've got to drive a long piece, haven't we? Mrs. Spencer said it was eight miles. I'm glad because I love driving. Oh, it seems so wonderful that I'm going to live with you and belong to you. I've never belonged to anyone. Not really. But the asylum was the worst. I've only been in it four months, but that was enough. I don't suppose you were ever an orphan in an asylum, so you can't possibly imagine what it's like. It's worse than anything you could imagine. Mrs. Spencer said it was wicked of me to talk like that, but I didn't need to be wicked. It's so easy to be wicked without knowing it, isn't it? They were good, you know, the asylum people. But there is so little scope for the imagination in an asylum, just only in the other orphans. It was pretty interesting to imagine things about them. To imagine perhaps the girl who sat next to you was really the daughter of a belted earl who had been stolen away from her parents in her infancy by a cruel nurse who died before he, she could confess. I used to lie awake at nights and imagine things like that because I didn't have the time to, in the day. I guess that's why I'm so thin. I am dreadfully thin, aren't I? There isn't a pick on my bones. I do love to imagine that I'm nice and plump with dimples in my elbows. With this, Matthew's companion stopped talking, partly because she was out of breath and partly because they had reached the buggy. Not another word did she say until they had left the village and were driving down a steep little hill, the road part which had been cut so deeply into the soft soil that the banks, fringed with blooming wild cherry trees and slim white birches, were several feet above their heads. The child put out her hand and broke off a branch of wild plum that brushed against the buggy. Isn't it beautiful? What did that tree, leaning far out from the bank, all white and lacy, make you think of? She asked. Well, now, I don't know, said Matthew. Why, a bride, of course. A bride in all white with a lovely misty veil. I've never seen one, but I can imagine what she would look like. I don't ever expect to be a bride myself. I'm so homely no one will ever want to marry me, unless it might be a foreign missionary. I suppose a foreign missionary might might not be very particular, but I do hope that someday I shall have a white dress. It is my highest ideal of earthly bliss. I just love pretty clothes, and I've never had a pretty dress in my life that I can remember. But of course, it's all the more to look forward to, isn't it? And I can imagine that I'd be, I'm dressed so gorgeously. This morning when I left the asylum, I felt so ashamed because I had to wear this horrid old wincy dress. All the orphans had to wear them, you know. A merchant in Hopetown last winter donated 300 yards of Wincy to the asylum. Some people said it was because he couldn't sell it, but I'd rather believe that it was out of the kindness of his heart, wouldn't you? When we got on the train, I felt as if everyone must be looking at me and pitying me. But I just went to work and imagined that I had on the most beautiful, 
pale, silk, pale blue silk dress because when you are imagining, you might as well imagine something worthwhile. And a big hat, all flowers and nodding plums, and a gold watch and kid gloves, kid gloves and boots. I felt cheered up right away and I enjoyed my trip to the island with all my might. I wasn't a bit sick coming over in the boat. Neither was Mrs. Spencer, although she generally is. She said she hadn't had time to get sick watching to see that I didn't fall overboard. She said she never saw the beat of me for prowling around. But if it kept, it from, kept her from being seasick, it was a mercy I did prowl, isn't it? And I wanted to see everything there was to be seen on that boat because I didn't know whether I'd ever have another opportunity. Oh, there are more cherry trees all in bloom. This island is the bloomingless place. I just love it already, and I'm so glad I'm going to live here. I've always heard that Prince Edward Island was the prettiest place in the world, and I used to imagine I was living here, but I never really expected that I would. It's delightful when your imaginations come true, isn't it? But all those red roads are so funny. When we got onto the train at Charlottetown, and the red roads began to flash past, I asked Mrs. Spencer what made them red, and she didn't know, and for pity's sake, not to ask her any more questions. She said I must have asked her a thousand already. I suppose I had too, but how are you going to find out about things if you don't ask questions? And what does make the roads red? Well, now, I don't know, said Matthew. Well, it's just one of the things to find out sometime. Isn't it splendid to think of all of the things there are to find out about? It just makes me feel glad to be alive. It's such an interesting world. It wouldn't be half so interesting if we knew all about everything, would it? There would be no scope for imagination then. But am I talking too much? People are always telling me that I do. Would you rather I didn't talk? If you say so, I'll stop. I can stop when I make up my mind to it, although it's difficult. Matthew, to his surprise, was enjoying himself. Like most quiet folk, he liked talkative people when they were willing to do the talking themselves and did not expect him to keep his, up his end of it. But he had never expected to enjoy the society of a little girl. Women were bad enough in all conscience, but little girls were worse. He detested the way they had of sidling past him timidly with sidewise glances as if they expected him to gobble them up at a mouthful if they ventured to say a word. This was the only type of well-bred little girl. But this freckled witch was very different, and although he found it rather difficult for his slower intelligence to keep up with her brisk mental progress, he thought that he kind of liked her chatter. So he said as shyly as usual, Oh, you can talk as much as you like. I don't mind. Oh, I'm so glad. It's such a relief to talk when one wants to and not be told that children should be seen and not heard. I've had that said to, me, said to me a million times if I've had it once, and people laugh at me because I use big words. But if you have big ideas, you have to use big words to express them, haven't you? Well, now, that seems reasonable. Mrs. Spencer said that my tongue must be hung in the middle. But it isn't. It's firmly fastened at one end. Mrs. Spencer said your place was called Green Gables. I asked her all about it, and she said there were trees all around. I'm gladder, I was gladder than ever. I just love trees, and there weren't anything, any at all out at the asylum, only a, pu a few poor weeny teeny things out in front with little whitewashed cagey things around them. They just looked like orphans themselves, those trees did. It used to make me want to cry to look at them. I used to say to them, Oh, you poor things! If you were out in a great big woods with other trees all around you, and little mosses and june bells growing over your roots, and a brook not far away, and birds singing in your branches, you could grow, couldn't you? But you can't where you are. I know just exactly how you feel, little trees. I felt sorry to leave them behind this morning. You do get so attached to things like that, don't you? Is there a brook anywhere near Green Gables? I forgot to ask Mrs. Spencer about that. Well, now yes. There is one right below the house. Fancy, it's always been one of my dreams to live near a brook, 
I just never expected I would, though. Dreams don't often come true, do they? Wouldn't it be nice if they did? But just now, I feel pretty nearly perfectly happy. I can't exactly perfectly happy because, well, what color would you call this? She twitched up one of her long, glossy braids over her thin shoulders and held it up before Matthew's eyes. Matthew was not used to deciding on the tints of ladies' tresses. Tresses meet is another word for a hair, but in this case, there couldn't be much doubt. It's red, ain't it? The, braid, the girl let the braid drop down with a sigh that seemed to come from her very toes and exhale forth of all the sorrows of the ages. Yes, it's red, she said resignedly. Now you see why I can't be perfectly happy. No one could who had red hair. I don't mind the other things so much, the freckles and the green eyes and my skinniness. I can imagine them away. I can imagine that I have a beautiful rose leaf complexion and starry, lovely starry violet eyes. But I cannot imagine that red hair away. I'll do my best. I'll think to myself, now my hair is a glorious black, black as the raven's wing. But all the time, I know it's just plain red. And it breaks my heart. It will be my lifelong sorrow. I read of a girl once who had a lifelong sorrow, but it wasn't red hair. Her hair was pure gold rippling from her alabaster brow. What is an alabaster brow? I never could find out. Can you tell me? Well, now, I'm afraid I can't, said Matthew, who was getting a little dizzy. He had felt he had he felt as he had once in his rash youth when another boy enticed him to go on the merry-go-round at a picnic. Well, whatever it was, it must have been something nice, because she was divinely beautiful. Have you ima ever imagined what it must be like to be divinely beautiful? Well, now, no, I haven't, confessed Matthew ingenuously. I have, often. Which would, which would you rather be if you had the choice? Divinely beautiful, or de dazzlingly clever, or angelically good? Well, now, I don't know exactly. Neither do I. I can never decide. But it doesn't make much real difference, for it isn't likely I'll ever be either. It's certain I'll never be angelically good. Mrs. Spencer says, Oh, Mr. Cuthbert! Oh, Mr. Cuthbert! Oh, Mr. Cuthbert! That was not what Mrs. Spencer had said. Neither had the child tumbled out of the buggy, nor had Monk Matthew done anything astonishing. They had simply rounded a curve in the road and found themselves in the avenue. The avenue, so called by the New Bridge people, was a stretch of road four or five hundred yards long, completely arched over with huge wide-spreading apple trees, planted years ago by an eccentric old farmer. Overhead was one long canopy of snowy fragrant, fragrant bloom. Below the brows, the air was full of a purple twilight, and far ahead a glimpse of painted sunset sky shone like a great rose window at the end of the cathedral aisle. Its beauty seemed to strike the child dumb. She leaned back in the buggy, her thin hands clasped before her, her face lifted rapturously to the white splendor above. Even when they had passed out and were driving down the long slope to Newbridge, she never spoke or moved. Still with rapt face, she gazed afar into the sunset west with eyes that saw visions trooping splendidly across the glowing background. Though Newbridge, a bustling little village where dogs barked at them and small boys hooted and curious faces peered from the windows, they drove, still in silence. When three or more miles had dropped behind them, the child had not spoken. She could keep silent, it was evident, as energetically as she could talk. I guess you're feeling pretty tired and hungry, Matthew ventured at last, accounted, accounting for a long visitation of dumbness with the only reason he could think of. But we haven't very far to go now, only another mile. 
She came out of her revere with a deep sigh and looked at him with the dreamy gaze of a soul that had been wander wandering a field, starlit. Oh, Mr. Cuthbert, she whispered, that place we came through, that white place, what was it? Well, now you must mean the avenue, said Matthew after a few moments of profound reflection. It is kind of a pretty place. Pretty? Oh, pretty doesn't seem the right word to use, nor beautiful either. They don't go far enough. Oh, it was wonderful, wonderful. It's the first thing I ever saw that couldn't be approved upon by imagination. It just satisfies me here. She put one hand over her breast. It made a queer, funny ache, and yet it was a pleasant ache. Did you ever have an ache like that, Mr. Cuthbert? Well, now, I just can't recollect that I ever had. I have it lots of time, whenever I see something royally beautiful. But they shouldn't call that lovely place the Avenue. There's no meaning in a name like that. They should see it, they should call it, let me see, the White Way of Delight. Isn't that such a nice imaginative name? When I don't like the name of a place or a person, I always imagine a new one and always think of them just so. There was a girl at the asylum whose name was Hepsa Jenkins, but I always imagined her as Rosalind Devere. Other pe people might call that place the avenue, but I shall always call it the White Way of Delight. Have we really only another mile until we be to go before we get home? I'm glad, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry because this drive has been so pleasant, and I'm always so sorry when pleasant things end. Sometimes still, pleasanter may come after, but you can never be sure. And so it's often the case that this isn't pleasanter. That's been my experience, anyhow. But I'm glad to think of getting home. You see, I've never had a real home since I can remember. It just gives me that pleasant ache again just to think of coming to a truly home. Oh, isn't it pretty? They had driven over the crest of a hill. Below them was a pond, looking almost like a river, so long and winding was it. A bridge spanned it midway, and from there to its lower end, where an amber-hued belt of sand hills shut it in from the dark blue gulf belong. Beyond, the water was a glory of many shifting hues, the most spiritual shadings of crocus and froze and earthial green, with other elusive tintings for which no name had ever been found. Above the bridge, the pond lay, ran up into fr fringing groves of fir and maple and lay all darkly translucent, translucent and their wavering shadows. Here and there, a wild plum leaned out from the bank like a white-clad girl tiptoeing to her own reflection. From the marsh at the head of the pond came the clear, mournfully sweet chorus of the frogs. There was a little gray house peering around a white apple orchard on a slope beyond, and though it was not quite dark, a light was shining from one of the, its windows. That's Barry's Pond, said Matthew. Oh, I don't like that name either. I should, shall call it, let me see, the Lake of Shining Waters. Yes, that is the right name for it. I know because of the thrill. When I hit on a name that suits it exactly, it gives me a thrill. Do you, things ever give you a thrill? Matthew ruminated. Well, now, yes. It always gives a kind... It always kinds of gives me a thrill to see them ugly white grubs that spade up in the cucumber beds. I hate the look of them. Oh, I don't think that it can be the same kind of thrill. Do you think it can? There doesn't seem to be much connection between grubs and lakes of shining water, does it? But why do people call it Berry Pond? I reckon because Mr. Berry lives up there in that house. Orchids, orchid slopes the name of his place. If it wasn't for that big bush behind it, you could see the green gables from here. But we have to go over the bridge and round by the road, so it's nearly a half mile further. Has Mr. Berry any little girls? Well, not so very little either. About my size? He's got one, about eleven. Her name's Diana. Oh, 
with a long indrawing of breath. What a perfectly lovely name! Well, now, I don't know. There's something dreadful heathenish about it, seems to me. I'd rather Jane or Mary or some sensible name like that. But when Diana was born, there was a schoolmaster boarding there, and they gave him the naming of her, and he called her Diana. I wish there had been a schoolmaster like that about when I was born then. Oh, here we are at the bridge. I'm going to shut my eyes tight. I'm always afraid of going over bridges. I can't help imagining that perhaps just as we get to the middle, they'll crumple up like a jackknife and nip us. So I shut my eyes, but I always have to open them for all when I think when we're getting near the middle, because, you see, if the bridge did crumple up, I'd want to see it crumple. What a jolly rumble it makes. I always like the rumble part of it. Isn't it splendid that there are so many things to like in this world? There, we're over. Now I'll look back. Good night, dear lake of shining waters. I'll always say good night to the things I love, just as I would to people. I think they'll like it. That water looks as if it was smiling at me. When they had driven up the further hill and around the corner, Matthew said, We're pretty near home now. That's Green Gables over. Oh, don't tell me, she interrupted breath breathlessly, catching his partially raised arm and shutting her eyes that she might not see his gesture. Let me guess. I'm sure I'll guess right. She opened her eyes and looked about her. They were on a crest of the hill. The sun had set some time since, but the landscape was still clear in the meadow ah mellow after light. To the west, a dark church spire rose up against a marigold sky. Below was a little valley, and beyond, a long, gently rising slope with snug farmsteads scattered along it. From one to another, the child's eyes darted, eager and wistful. At last, they lingered on one away to the left, far back from the road, dimly white with blooming trees in the twilight of the surrounding woods. Over, over it in the stainless southwest sky, a great crystal white star was shining like a light lamp of guidance and province. That's it, isn't it? She said, pointing. Matthew slapped the brains on the sorrel's black delight. Delightedly. Well, now, you've guessed it. But I reckon Mrs. Spencer described it so as you could tell. No, she didn't. She really didn't. All she said might have just as well been about most of those other places. I hadn't any real idea of what it looked like, but as soon as I saw it, I felt it was home. Oh, it seems as if I must be in a dream. Do you know, my I must be black and blue from the elbow up, for I've pinched myself so many times today. Every little while, a horrible sinking feeling would come over me, and I'd be so afraid it was all a dream. Then I'd pinch myself to see if it was real until suddenly I remembered that even supposing it was a dream, I'd better go on dreaming for as long as I could, so I stopped pinching. But it is real, and we're nearly home. With a sigh of rapture, she lapsed into silence. Matthew stirred uneasily. He felt glad that it would be Marla and not he who would have to tell her, tell this waif of the world that the home she was longed for was not to be hers after all. They drove over Lint Hollow, where it was already quite dark, but not so dark that Mrs. Rachel could not see them from her window vantage, and up the hill and onto the long lane of Green Gables. By the time they arrived at the house, Matthew was shrinking from the approaching revelation with an energy he did not understand. It was not Marla or himself he was thinking of, nor the trouble this mistake was probably going to make for them. But of the child's disappointment. When he thought of that rapt light being quenched in her eyes, he had the uncomfortable feeling that he was going to be assisting him assist at murdering something. Much the same feeling that came over him when he had to kill a lamb or a calf or any other innocent little creature. The yard was quite dark as they turned into it, and the poplar leaves were rustling silkily all around it. Listen to the leaves talking in their sleep, she whispered, as he lifted her to the ground. What nice dreams they must have. And then, holding tightly to the carpet bag, which contained all her worldly belongings, she followed him to the house. 
and that's the end of chapter two. So that's where we're going to leave it for today. Um, but I am going to post a question to you guys, and if you want, feel free to answer in the comments. So, um, in this chapter that we just read, chapter two, um, Anne said, um, isn't it splendid to think of all of the things there are to find out about? It just makes me feel glad to be alive. It's such an interesting world. It wouldn't be half so interesting if we knew all about everything, would it? There would be no scope of imagination then, would there? So with that, the question I'm putting to you is, thinking about that quote, what do you think? Would it be better to know everything about everything that was ever to happen? Or do you guys like using your imagination and thinking up things and then looking to, up to see what, how things actually are? So leave me a comment on the video and I will see you tomorrow at 3 o'clock as well for Boredom Busters. Have a great rest of your day, guys.